Hello, my name is Giza and I'm excited to get to spend some time with you all here today. If you're new to Hope or are a regular, make sure that while you're on here watching to hit the like and the subscribe button so you get notified when anything new gets posted on this channel and so that you can always feel a part of what's going on here at Hope. Another way to engage is through your generosity. Here at Hope we have several safe ways that you can give online on our website at hopepd.org or you can text to give at 84321 or mail it in to our office at 45900 Portola Avenue, Palm Desert, California 92260. Your giving is so important and I want to thank you in advance as none of these ministries here at Hope could reach the community the way they do without your ongoing generous support. In today's message, we continue to look at how some things never change. The world we live in is in, I mean, it's constantly changing, often hard for us to keep up with, especially us old people, right? Which can be stressful and cause a lot of confusion and anxiety. But thankfully, there's one thing in the midst of the change, and that is the unmerited grace of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. That no matter what changes are happening in us and around us, Jesus still saves. Some of you know me and are aware of my love for exercise and the outdoors and also how hard it's been in the past to motivate my husband to participate in any of it. Well, as of recent, my husband gave road biking a try and since actually has literally fallen in love with it. Absolutely amazing for so many reasons, but for me personally, it's been so great because we now have a physical outdoor activity we can enjoy together. And so a couple weeks ago, we went on an early morning ride. You know, it's summer and we live in the desert, so going for a ride in the morning means it has to be like before 6 a.m. Well, we had ridden about 32 miles and are feeling pretty accomplished, so we decided to take a coffee break at a, at a local coffee shop, shop and then finish the last six miles home. I'm also hungry at this point, so we both actually go inside to order. Now, as you can maybe picture, we're in our biking gear, so I'm walking somewhat awkwardly in my bike shoes into the shop. These shoes are plastic on the bottom, the front sticks up and the tile floor feels slippery because they have the misters on outside. When we come back out, I realize that the table where we set down our helmets and other things is really wet from the misters. I decide that we should move to a different table, so I pick up anything I can grab while holding a cup of coffee in one hand and a yogurt parfait, you know, like a cup of yogurt with berries and granola on top, in the other hand. Well, I take like maybe, maybe two steps forward when my right foot flies out from underneath me. I slip on the wet tile floor and I land hard. I mean hard with my whole right side of my body on the wet, hard tile floor. The yogurt cup hits the ground, flies open and spews all over the ground, and the cup of coffee lands upside down on the other side of me. Now, Gerald, he's watching <laughs> this entire scene happening, and with all the empathy he can possibly gather up, he asks me, did you hit your head? To which I replied, no. To which he says, okay, then I'm gonna go inside and get you a new yogurt. Now, picture, I'm still on the ground, in shock and in pain and no idea if I have injured any parts of my body. And Gerald, he proceeds to leave me there on the ground to get a new yogurt. I'm hurt, I'm hurt from the fall. I'm frustrated that I've fallen and I'm mad that he left me there. 
and I made sure he knew how much when he comes back out. To make things worse, Gerald reacts to me yelling at him with telling me that he had never slipped once, which doesn't help the situation, and he's basically telling me how stupid that was of me to have slipped and now be laying there on the ground hurt. Well, eventually I realize I can move all body parts and Gerald does help me up into a chair and we slowly settle down. I look around and am glad to see no one is there who could have witnessed this intense marriage drama. Unless they did, of course, and maybe had already left the scene. This all was somewhat horrifying to me because I hate fighting and I was immediately thinking of the herd we possibly could have caused in, each, caused in each other and how long it would take us to overcome and heal from this. We've been married for a while and I remember what it can be like when we have a fight like this, how it affects our relationship for at least a little while after. So I sit back, I take a sip of my coffee and a bite of my new yogurt, when all of a sudden I feel a change of heart happening inside of me and I can't hold back. I literally start laughing. Actually, we both do. And Gerald apologizes for not caring for me the way I had desired him to. And I apologize to him for yelling at him. And then we both realize how ridiculous and funny the whole scene would have looked to an outsider. I sure do wish that I had some pictures or maybe a video of some kind. Life happens, doesn't it? Things happen, we lose our cool, we do things or react in ways we, react, we, we regret later. But th some things never change. And one of those things, one thing that is and will always be true is that Jesus still saves. That if we acknowledge Jesus and the grace given to us through him by God, grace that we can receive for ourselves and that is available for us to share with others, we can experience the saving power of Jesus in our lives. Paul, a first century Christian leader, while on his second missionary journey to share about the good news of Jesus Christ, ends up in prison in Rome alongside his friend and missionary partner Silas. In the book of Acts written by Luke, a physician and also a missionary companion of Paul, he describes the prison situation like this. About Paul, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was an earthquake, so violent that the foundations of the prisons were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. The jailer, the prison guard, his first reaction once he realizes the situation he's in, he wants to kill himself because he expects to be executed for allowing any prisoners to escape. He doesn't believe that anything can save him in that moment. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, Do not harm yourselves, for we are all here. The jailer called for lights and rushing in, he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. See, the jailer can't believe what he hears and what he sees. The prisoners are still inside. No one had escaped, even though the doors were wide open. Plus, they're encouraging him not to kill himself. He is trembling because he absolutely knows he's witnessing something supernatural. He's experiencing a miracle happening right in front of his eyes. He's not only the one who kept these prisoners locked up with barely any food and nothing other than their clothes to sleep in on the hard ground tied up by their feet. He's also most likely the one who's been beating them. He is aware of what he has done to these people and the sense of guilt and shame is overwhelming him. Do you relate to that? Have you ever had a moment when remembering the hurts, the wounds, the things you have done in your past seems um, overwhelming? That's how the jailer feels in this moment and since he knows who Paul and Silas are and has, any, has an idea actually why they ended up in prison, he asked them this question. Sirs, 
What must I do to be saved? The jailer humbly admits here that he is in need. He admits he can't free himself from the shame he's experiencing. And Paul and Silas have the answer for him. Believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Did you hear that? That is all it takes for the jailer to be saved by Jesus and for all of us as well to humbly believe in Jesus. But what does that actually mean, right? I mean, what does that look like for this jailer or for you or for me to humbly believe in Jesus? It means that we need to be able to allow our head knowledge that Jesus exists to move down to our hearts, believing that Jesus is working in our day-to-day -day lives that we completely trust in our hearts that Jesus was the Son of God who paid the price on the cross, that he died and rose from the dead to overcome all of our shortcomings yesterday, today, and into the future. To really believe means that we trust that Jesus is the one to rely on when we need help, when we need to find freedom from our past, when we need the kind of grace only Jesus can offer. And once we believe, we need to demonstrate our belief by heading into a new direction. In the story of the jailer, the jailer demonstrates this by taking immediate action. At the same hour of the night, he took them and washed their feet. He went to wash their feet. The jailer responds with immediate action. It says, at the same hour, he took their word and allowed Jesus to change him. He believed that Jesus could make things better for him in his life. And then he followed his belief with a change of action. He changed direction 180 degrees. Instead of mistreating Paul and Silas, he took them and cleaned their wounds. He showed remorse and tried to make up for the hurt he had caused them. There is a ministry here at Hope called Celebrate Recovery. At Celebrate Recovery, people come because they're struggling with all kinds of different life's hurts that because those didn't get addressed, turn into hangups that then begin to impact how they think about and react to life. And eventually, those hangups, they turn into habits that cause even more pain and hurt in their own lives and in the lives of the people around them. What we learn at Celebrate Recovery is that we need to come clean, that when there is a problem, that it needs to be addressed. Then we need to admit that we have a need for help from outside of ourselves. To be able to begin healing any of it, we need to believe that we need Jesus and that Jesus is the one who can heal us, who can save us and help us recover from our habits, redeem us, from the hang-ups and all the underlying hurts so we can find freedom in the grace of our Savior. Right now, I'd like us to take a moment and I want to show you some testimonies of what Jesus can do in people's lives when we truly believe and in how allow His grace to work in our lives and save us. There's Mike, lost in using alcohol and marijuana. Now, 11 years clean through God and recovery. There's Rachel, insecure and low self-worth, lied and manipulated to get attention, ashamed. Now, fearfully and wonderfully made, speaking the truth and love and feeling saved by grace. There's Stephanie, felt untethered but today feeling held. Terry, used to struggle with anxiety, suicidal idolatry and depression, but today, found God, overcame anxiety, and found safe people. Bobby, life lived with suppression, depression, and anger, but since has experienced healing, hope, freedom, and peace. And then there's Dan, feeling angry and prideful and was running from God, but today feels love and accepted, humble and, sur and surrendered. And Lucia, 
was stuck in denial and always seeking approval of others, but today found freedom in embracing her truth and the truth of God's promises. Jesus still saves, not just an attorney, but also right here and right now. Jesus saved the jailer from a lifelong battle with shame for the hurt he had caused so many people, including Paul and Silas. Jesus saved each one of the people sharing their testimonies from their alcohol, you know, chemical, codependency, anger, struggles with pride, self-worth, depression, anxiety, and on and on. Jesus saved me and my husband from causing unnecessary hurt because of our reaction in such a pointless fight. Even though, I have to say, leaving me on the ground, that definitely deserves a moment of attention. <laughs> Jesus still saves. And Jesus can and will save you too if you come clean and admit your need. If you humbly believe in your heart that life is better with Jesus in it. And if you're willing to demonstrate that sincerely by changing your actions and heading into a new direction. And then there is one other way that you can express your readiness to believe that Jesus still saves, and that is through baptism. In our story, the next thing that happens after the jailer cleans Paul and Silas's wounds is this. Then and he, and his family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before them, and he and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. If you've never been baptized, I want to encourage you to take that step. We'd be glad to baptize you here at Hope. Just send an email to gabe at hopepd.org and he'll help you to get that sup, set up as soon as possible. So, you also can begin to believe that while life happens with all the good and the bad and all the changes, that you can trust that some things never change. And the most important one is that Jesus still saves. Let me pray. Dear God, thank you for your word today and your reminder that you are still here to save us in our lives, with our struggles, with our dependencies, with anything that we can't manage on our own. So God, help us to recognize when we do, help us come clean, help us get close to you and allow us to let you come into the situation so that we can realize that maybe that even though so many things change, that one thing does not, and that is that you will save. And for all of us, I pray in your precious name, Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're so glad you were here today and finishing the series with up and us and I up, and I definitely look forward to seeing you for what's to come next week, back here online or in person on campus. See you there.